um, in spherical coordinates is minus kt squared plus dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Um, and so what we do in this case is um, do exactly the same thing as before on the tr direction. This looks just like uh, the two-dimensional case. The only difference is that r starts at 0 now. Um, so this diagram, um, well, first let me draw the Penrose diagram. Uh, OK, so this is the Penrose diagram of uh, Minkowski space in more than two dimensions. Each point on this diagram is a S2. Um, and this line at the left is r equals 0. So nothing special happens at that line. It's just the, we really have to imagine uh, rotating this around to make it uh, four dimensional. Um, the fixed r, curves of fixed r look like this. Curve of, curves of fixed T uh, look like that. If you're doing something that's sphere, if you're working on something or thinking about something that's spherically symmetric, then uh, this is a great way to draw it because we've suppressed the, the sphere directions, the S2 directions. Um, but it can also be very confusing if you're working on, if you're trying to think about something that's not spherically symmetric. So for example, where is Rindler space on this diagram? Well, nowhere, kind of, um, because um, Rindler space is not, is not spherically symmetric. You can do a little better uh, if you blow up one of the sphere directions and think of, think of Minkowski space as being shaped like this. where this is now, um, this is the same diagram, just rotated around. Uh, this, of course, is still not quite right. This is a three-dimensional diagram for four-dimensional space-time. So you have to think of each of these. Um, you have to think of like this S1 here as really being an S2. Uh, and then this is the shape of, of uh, Minkowski space. So now we now we can draw Rindler space like um, something like this. That's the Rindler horizon going one way. That's the horizon going the other way. So Rindler is over here. So um, the point of this reminder was so that I could show you the thing that's on the blackboard. This is the Penrose diagram of the Reeser Nordstrom black hole, um, which we started talking about last time. I think I already wrote up the metric. See that? Yeah. Um, so. Um, So this is, this is the, the Penrose diagram. Um, the way to think about this is that we live here. OK, we don't, don't, we don't really care where we live for Penrose diagram. But if you want to think about us living somewhere, then we live here. Um, and the, the, the outer part of this diagram is just ordinary, is the same as, as the outer part of the Minkowski diagram. Okay, so. Like this up here is our future null infinity. Uh, this is past null infinity. Um, everything out there is basically Minkowski. Um, but as you go in, you encounter uh, the horizon at r equals r plus. All of these lines are r plus, r plus, r plus. Um, and if you 
jump through the horizon, which I don't recommend, then um, you'll eventually get to R minus. The distance, or the, the, as you travel between R plus and R minus, R is actually a time direction. Okay, so the decreasing R is, is, is going up that way. Um, and then you'll get to R minus. These are all R minus. Um, and then you can keep going, or you can hit the singularity, or whatever, and this just keeps tiling and going on forever. Yeah. Um, the collapsing black hole space time for, for short shield. Yeah. And the diagram has like an infalling shell of matter that uh -huh. it ends up ending on the horizon. What would that look like here? Would it be somewhat similar? Or would, like, um, it not ends on the horizon, it's a singularity. What would that look like here? Yeah. Because um, this is an extended diagram. Let's see. The. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw the Penrose diagram for the collapsing short shield black hole yeah. later. Um, Would this also end up at the singularity? Like I I, I, I actually I can't quite remember what the situation is. This is a topic of much debate as to whether generic initial conditions like a collapsing black hole will produce singularities that are that are time like or space like as in short shield or null. Um, and I'm actually not sure what the latest on that discussion is. There's been a lot of debate about it. Um, I think they're, I, I believe they're either null or very close to null. So you effectively get um, null or nearly null singularities. Um, What's the context for those? What? What are the contexts in which null singularities occur? Like a realistic, like a real black hole. It's not literally null. I can't remember if it's slightly slightly time-like or, sp or slightly space-like, uh, but it's very close to null. Even in a in a space-time like this, in recent Nordstrom, um, the, although what I've drawn here is a perfectly good, good classical solutions of the equation solution of the equations of motion. Um, if you actually tried to make this, it would very quickly develop a singularity here, or or something at least um, something very very like a singularity. Basically because if you drop in like one atom into this black hole, um, then anything that gets to here is infinitely blue shifted. And so as soon as you start perturbing this space time, there's an infinite blue shift here and uh, will will cause a back reaction and cause this uh, space time to, to look a little bit different. So. For most purposes, maybe even all purposes, everything above R minus uh, is, is stuff we probably shouldn't think about. And um, what I mean by that is that it, it might not make sense in the quantum theory. It definitely doesn't exist in a realistic black hole. Um, and I've never seen any like meaningful use of it. So to, to show that it repeats, you'd have to actually derive this by taking the, um, so the way you would derive it for a black hole, so you take the recent Nordstrom metric, and um, you choose some, you go to an ingoing coordinate system, which is um, something that uh, you probably did in a GR class, like ingoing editing Finkelstein coordinates. Um, and you would you would follow it in, and then you would you would check whether it was complete or not by asking whether uh, any any geodesics or, or curves that started in this region could could escape it, and you could find a new coordinate system that covered this region, um, and you would just keep doing that, and you find that it repeats. I don't have a. I don't have a more intuitive explanation than that. Hmm. 
Uh, yeah, that's a different diagram, um, which I didn't draw. Um, I could draw it. Now it looks like this. This is Q equals M. Um, but similar sort of story, just every, all those horizons now are R plus, and we live here. Yeah? Why does the space time have to be complete? Why does it have to be complete? Yeah, why not just say uh, you can have geodesics that don't continue, and then you don't have to run into this whole problem with uh, yeah, good question. I think this this maximal analytic completion, which is what this is called, um, is a mathematical construction. Space times don't have to be complete. They have singularities. They 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 don't look like this. We're going to talk about collapsing black holes. They don't have diagrams like this. Um, This is just what you get if you literally take the recent Oster metric and ask what is the manifold that this is a coordinate system on. Well, this is the manifold. This is what it looks like. So this is a manifold we can talk about. Um, the part up there, uh, as far as I know, is basically useless and meaningless. The part over here is, uh, do I have it right? Yeah, the part over here, this is also unphysical in the sense that real black holes in the real world don't have this piece. Um, but this piece is extremely useful. Uh, mathematically, um, and we are going to make a lot of use of this, um, but it's a, it's a it's a mathematical device. It's not a it's not a, it's not something real. It's not a real black hole. So now we're going to talk about black hole thermodynamics. Uh, first, I want to remind you how ordinary thermodynamics works. Uh, there's a first law. I promise I won't take long. Uh, so the, there's a first law, uh, which is just conservation of energy. So delta E is delta Q plus W, where delta Q is the heat transferred and W is the work. In quasi-static situations, uh, you have what's sometimes called the Clausius relation uh, for the uh, heat transfer. The heat transfer delta Q is TDS. Um, it's just TDS, and uh, if we plug that in, then uh, we can rearrange the first law to say TDS is equal to DE minus the work. Um, so the work term, uh, for our purposes, I'm going to write this way. It's minus phi DQ minus omega DJ. So um, what I've done is I've written the first law for a system that has a conserved charge. This is the uh, ordinary conserved charge of electromagnetism. Uh, phi here is the electric potential, um, which is the time component of the vector, uh, or sorry, the, of the um, vector potential. Um, Omega here is the angular potential, uh, which you can think of as defined as the coefficient of angular momentum uh, in this relation. Okay, so for each conserved, if there are more conserved charges, then we can put more terms here. 
Often you'll see a PDV term on, on, in here as part of the work term, like if you're studying heat engines or something, um, but we don't, uh, have a, we don't change the volume usually when we're talking about black holes, so we don't, don't talk about that term. Then there's the second law. The second law of thermodynamics, of course, says that the entropy uh, can only increase in uh, physical processes. Um, now, what is the entropy? Well, uh, originally in ordinary thermodynamics, entropy was uh, defined somewhat mysteriously by um, equations like this one, basically by, by following equations like this one around in, uh, in phase space. But of course, we know that in STATMEC, it has a microscopic interpretation as the log of the uh, number of states accessible uh, in the system. It's not, OK, so what do we mean? Maybe I should write this more carefully. The S, the entropy at energy E is the log of the number of states of energy E. Uh, we have to be a bit careful, because in ordinary thermodynamics, uh, we're usually thinking of S in the canonical ensemble. This is S in the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, but they agree in the thermodynamic limit. Um, so these are the same S. OK. So that was thermodynamics, now black hole thermodynamics. The first law of black hole thermodynamics. Um, I want to define, well, I don't know if I want to call this a definition. This is not a definition. We're going to talk about Hawking radiation. We're going to derive Hawking radiation next time. But Hawking radiation is the statement that when you take a quantum field and put it in a black hole, uh, it has a temperature. Okay, so I need to give you the formula for the temperature in order to make it easier to have this discussion. Uh, the Hawking temperature is kappa over 2 pi. Kappa is called the surface gravity. Uh, this has a physical interpretation, which I don't know if it's terribly useful, but um, the idea is that if you if you have a string, like a, a imaginary string, imaginary fishing pole, and you dangle a, a mass at the black hole horizon, uh, that this will be the the tension in your uh, in your imaginary string that you're dangling. I don't know if that's useful. Um, but that's what it is. Is it like the force exerted by the observer at infinity? Uh, that's right. This is the force exerted by the observer at infinity. So the, if, you're, if you're trying to hold something near the horizon of a black hole, or at the horizon of a black hole, while standing at the horizon of a black hole, that will require infinite force, because uh, you need to give it infinite acceleration. Uh, but that infinite force is redshifted uh, from the point of view of someone at infinity. So that infinities cancel. It's, it's an infinite force that's infinitely redshifted, and you're left with uh, the surface gravity. I don't think this is something you can really do, because there's no such thing as an ideal string like this. I mean, even in string theory, you don't have strings that can do this. Um, so OK, but that's, but that's one way of interpreting it. Um, for the recent Nordstrom black hole metric that we wrote up earlier, uh, the formula looks like this. 
And we're going to derive this later. Uh, for now, just take my word for it that this is the Hawking temperature. Now, let's define the entropy, which is called the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. SBH, which stands either for black hole or Bekenstein Hawking, is equal to the area of the event horizon over 4 uh, h bar d newton. And that's h bar newton's constant. OK? So um, this, for now, is a definition. We're just going to pretend that this, we're just going to call this thing entropy and proceed. There's no excuse yet. There's no reason whatsoever that, that you should call that an entropy, but we're going to. Okay. So for Reese and Nordstrom, um, maybe I need the metric again. Um, <coughs> Yeah, let's write the metric again. That was minus f of r dr squared, uh, sorry, dt squared plus dr squared over f of r plus r squared d omega squared, where f is 1 over r squared r minus r plus r minus r minus. And r plus minus was m plus minus m squared minus q squared. So let's calculate the area of the event horizon. Um, yeah. What point are we setting? Uh, it's one here, it's not one there. I just put it in the Bekenstein Hawking formula um, in order to reintroduce units in the final answer. Um, so the event horizon uh, is the outer horizon, r equals r plus, and um, we set dt to, so we want to find the metric on the, on the horizon, so ds squared on the horizon, and we're also going to um, set t equals 0. I guess I should clarify that when we say area of the event horizon, we mean at fixed time. The event horizon is a null surface, uh, but we mean when we say the area of the event horizon, we mean a, a, a two-dimensional thing, which is just one cross-section of the event horizon at fixed time. Um, so we're going to look at the area of the horizon. Uh, we set t to 0, um, r to r plus. And in that case, the metric here is just going to be r plus squared the omega squared. Um, so the entropy, well, so the area is 4 pi r plus squared, and therefore the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy uh, is pi times m plus the square root of m squared minus q squared squared. To do, remember we're trying to check the first law. I guess I've erased my, my first law, but you have it. It's obtained by varying the entropy. 
So we just vary it. We vary the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And um, after about a line of algebra, here's what you find. TDS is equal to dm minus phi dq, where um, phi here is defined to be minus a uh, t and r equals r plus. If you go back to our recent Nordstrom solution, you can check that this is um, q over r plus. I hope I got the sign right. Um, I think I got the sign right. Um, okay, so the, the phi that's showing up here, this is just the ordinary electric potential, uh, now evaluated at the horizon of the black hole. And this, of course, looks just like the first law of thermodynamics uh, that we wrote up a few minutes ago. Um, now, at this point, you should be sort of skeptical. Um, I didn't really have any good excuse to call this an entropy. And indeed, when people first wrote this equation down, they thought of it just as an analogy. Like, oh, isn't that cute? It kind of looks like thermodynamics. Uh, we think now that it's actual thermodynamics, and we're going to discuss that in great detail. I also want to comment that um, this equation is, is just a rewriting of the Einstein equation. Right? What we did is we solved the Einstein equation, and we're looking at two nearby solutions of the Einstein equation. Okay, so there's like a linearized solution of the Einstein equation that, that relates these two nearby solutions. And what we're saying is there's this weird property of linearized solutions of the Einstein equation uh, that they obey this thermodynamic looking relationship. It's just a property of the Einstein equation now, rewritten with suggested variable names. So can you prove the converse then? Like by assuming Bekenstein Hawking entropy and the first law, can you prove that uh, this there is black holes much more than standard question. Sort of. Um, so if all you assume is, is this equation, this only tells you about uh, black hole solutions. OK, so there are other solutions to the Einstein equations that are not the recent Nordstrom black hole. Like, you know, we could add a graviton to the recent Nordstrom black hole, and that would also be a solution of the Einstein equations, and, and that doesn't quite fit into, into this equation. Um, it's true, however, that you can assume something like this relationship. You have to assume it, so there's, there's, a, there's a beautiful paper of Jacobson from 20 some years ago, where he assumes this equation for Rindler. He, he this, is, this is not easy to do, you, you have to, you have to um, define some things very carefully. He assumes this equation for Rindler horizons, which you can put everywhere in space-time, and shows that assuming the first law for Rindler horizons uh, actually gives you the complete Einstein equations. So there's some sense in which the complete nonlinear Einstein equations are equivalent to local thermodynamics uh, of Rindler horizons. That's very mysterious. Um, that's considered very deep, but not really very well understood. So when you say he assumed this equation, he assumed the Bekenstein Hawking form of the entropy as well? Yes. OK. OK, so, there's, so that's the first law. Um, now, when things start really getting interesting is that black holes also by a second law, uh, which says that the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy uh, must increase in any physical process. Uh, 
this is a statement about classical solutions of the Einstein equation. There, it's not quite true once we include other kinds of effects, matter, quantum effects, et cetera. We'll come back to that. But again, this is just a statement about solutions of PDEs. Okay, so this is the area, this is called the area theorem. Um, I think we're gonna prove it. I haven't decided. I think we're gonna prove it. Should we prove it? It's, it's a wonderful proof. It's <laughs> wonderful. Um, it takes us a little bit out of like the main line, of the, but it's, it's great. Um, so I think we'll probably do it. Um, but anyway, this is just a property of PDEs. The, the area of black holes can only go up. Uh, it's true not only for a single black hole, like if you throw something into a, if you throw in a, a book to a black hole, I don't know why I'm destroying books, throw in a rock mm -hmm. to a black hole, then the area will increase. Uh, but even more amazingly, it's true of like black hole mergers, for example. If, if you collide two black holes, it's a very violent uh, process. Um, all sorts of gravitational waves are emitted. It's very nonlinear, but at the end of the day, the area of the final black hole will be bigger than the sum of the areas of the two initial black holes. This is one of the few, um, this is one of the few totally analytic things that you can say about nonlinear GR uh, in the strong gravity regime. Okay, um, we're going to make a few, so, th so these are the laws of black hole thermodynamics. I'm going to make a few comments about them. We're going to keep discussing them throughout the course, but I want to make a few comments right off the bat. Curvature corrections. These are, this is a classical effect, and these are some kind, sometimes called stringy corrections because they come from, they uh, arise in string theory as a classical effect. Um, Remember, we started the course by talking about gravity as an effect of field theory. And we said that there's the Einstein-Hilbert term, but that really we should add higher curvature terms uh, into the action. This is a statement about the classical action. So this is a, a classical effect. Um, and the, uh, these have an effect on the entropy. Okay, so the statement that entropy is area over four is for this term. The more general statement is something called the walled entropy. Uh, the walled entropy is uh, going to be the bekenstein hawking entropy plus corrections coming from these higher curvature terms. I'm not going to write the uh, precise formula because it would require me to define a, a bunch of things that I don't want to define. Um, but I'll just write it schematically. It's an integral over the horizon of something you get by uh, varying the Lagrangian with respect to Riemann. Obviously that equation doesn't make sense. It has indices all over in wrong places, but schematically it's like this. You have to dot this into something. That's for the initial term, right? What? That's not for like the SPH. Ah, this is the whole thing, actually. That's the whole thing. This is the whole thing. So if you apply this formula to the to this, then you get the area over four, mm -hmm. and it includes the corrections as well. Um, the important thing just being that it's uh, defined locally at the horizon. So this is some kind of like entropy density. This, this thing defines some kind of entropy density. 
and you integrate that up over the horizon to get the entropy of the black hole. Um, So from this formula, is it correct to say that all the like all the microstates of the black hole would live at the horizon? No, I don't think. Well, it's very suggestive of that. You know, it, it suggests that it suggests that. Um, well, maybe I should emphasize this. It's pretty weird that the formula is an area formula, not a volume mm -hmm. formula. Right. If you have a like if you have a gas and you calculate the entropy of a gas, uh, it goes with the volume. For black holes, it goes with the area, which is very weird. Um, and as as you're saying, this suggests that the uh, degrees of freedom maybe sort of live at the horizon, and you have like one degree of freedom per Planck per Planck square. That gets you the counting correct. Um, I think it's maybe better, it's, we don't know to what extent that's true. I think the words where the degrees of freedom live are probably not really well defined because we have to be doing quantum gravity and uh, the classical space time might not quite make sense for asking the question where do these degrees of freedom live. Um, but it does appear that these degrees of freedom are sort of associated to the the horizon of the black hole, as opposed to being associated to everything on the inside. This is a, a, a early version of the holographic principle, uh, which led to the ADS CFT correspondence, and we're going to we're going to say more about it. But yeah, it's really crazy that 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 it's an area law, not a volume law. So even for black holes whose degrees of freedom were counted, like in string theory, like, yeah. so they still don't know where those degrees of freedom exactly live. Yeah, I don't think there's a real. I don't think there's a precise way of asking that question that, that has a precise answer. They're associated to the horizon. I wouldn't really. I wouldn't exactly say they live there because they they kind of they kind of are associated to the whole. They kind of live everywhere in a not entirely local kind of way. I think. Yeah. Is it safer to say that the features of the horizons? The features of the horizon arise from these degrees of freedom that you might get from string theory, and it's those features we're measuring that are able to give us some uh, these prop this property about the entropy. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the actual degrees of freedom look there. Is that a safer way to say it? Well, it's better than that. It's it's not just that the degrees of freedom tell you about the physics of the horizon. It's somehow the converse of that. That the, the horizon. I think uh, we suspect the holographic principle is roughly the statement that if you um, know everything about the quantum mechanics of the horizon, then you know everything about the black hole. That somehow, everything there is to know about the black hole is encoded in uh, its horizon somehow. That's a vague statement. There are some situations where we can make it precise, but in general, it's a, it's a, vague, it's a vague statement for motivation. So with curvature corrections, we could ask whether the laws of black hole thermodynamics are still obeyed. The first law is still obeyed. In fact, that's how Wald derived the Wald formula. It's a lot like uh, it's a lot like uh, you know 1800s thermodynamics. How do you find the entropy? You integrate up the first law, and that gives you the entropy. And Wald did something similar to derive the entropy of a black hole with these corrections. The story of the second law um, is more subtle. So here I'm going to give it a, a check in parentheses. OK, so um, there's some sense in which the second law is still true. Um, in quasi-equilibrium situations, it's not as it's not as nice a situation as the as the second law in ordinary gravity. The second remember I was saying before that this area theorem is completely nonlinear. It's a completely nonlinear statement. It applies to black hole mergers in the real world. 
uh, with uh, higher curvature corrections, um, we really only know how to define it and check it in quasi-equilibrium. But maybe that's all we should expect anyway. You know, entropy is a entropy is a near equilibrium thing quite often in, in StatMac as well. So it's not really clear exactly how we're how whether we're supposed to be able to completely define it out uh, far from equilibrium. So I would say yes, the second law still holds at least in cases where you think that it should have. It sounds funny. Theorems can't be violated. Um, the assumptions of the area theorem are violated by quantum effects, and indeed, the area of a black hole can decrease due to quantum effects. Um, in particular, Hawking radiation. Okay, so a black hole forms, it Hawking radiates. This is very slow, but eventually, it just radiates away to nothing. And the black hole's not there anymore, so along the way, the, the horizon area is decreasing. Um, but you can define what's called the generalized entropy. And uh, the generalized entropy does obey the second law, including quantum effects. The generalized entropy, we're also going to have more to say about this later, uh, but I'll just write it schematically for now. It's a sum over all the black holes in the universe of the walled entropy. So you get the walled, the, you get a contribution from the, from the horizons of all the black holes in the universe. Uh, and then you get a contribution from matter in the universe that's outside of black holes. It's only the part of the, it's only from matter that's outside of black holes. There's no contribution from matter inside black holes. That part uh, is intuitively you should think of as being already included in the black hole entropy. This matter part I'm going to define carefully later. Um, so let's just say, we'll do this later, uh, but in words I'll just tell you now. So um, the matter part includes what you usually think of as entropy. So like if you have like famously Wheeler like to talk about a cup of tea and throwing tea, sort of throwing hot tea into a black hole. Okay, so that tea has some entropy associated to it and you need to include that entropy of the T uh, when you when you um, ask for the second law to be to hold uh, but it includes not it, it includes more than that uh, so that's one contribution to s matter but there are also quantum contributions to s matter which are more subtle and we'll come to those later um, I guess I didn't Right, so if we so um, if we think about black holes that evaporate by Hawking radiation, then the area theorem is violated. The area of the black hole goes down as it shrinks, um, but the generalized entropy increases because the this the area term is going down, but we have to account for the entropy of the thermal gas of the Hawking radiation that's coming out, and um, this is going up, so we're good. Okay, the last comment that I want to make, I think, for now, um, is that 
as I emphasize, this S black hole uh, was defined, was just sort of observed to act like an entropy. There was no statistical basis for calling this an entropy. Uh, so it's a deep mystery of quantum gravity whether this is equal to the log of the number of states of something. In classical gravity, it is certainly not. Okay, so in classical gravity, um, how many states are there of a mass, uh, of a black hole of mass M? One. Okay, so classical gravity doesn't work. Um, but in quantum gravity, uh, we think that this is probably true, um, that these are, that the black hole entropy is counting the states of the quantum theory. There are examples in string theory where you can check that very explicitly, but we think it's true more generally. This is a huge number. Okay, so um, just to impress everybody, um, there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy called Sagittarius A star. The entropy of A star, uh, well, its event horizon is about 10 to the 6 kilometers. So if we take that and we divide by L Planck um, and square it to get the area and Planck units, then this is about 10 to the 88. For comparison, the entropy of all the baryons in the known universe is around 10 to the 82. And the entropy in the, the total entropy in the, in the known universe, which is dominated by the cosmic microwave background, is around 10 to the 89. Okay, so we're talking big numbers here. The entropy in Sagittarius A star is comparable to the entropy of the known universe. Um, good. That's it for now. Questions? Yeah. Does Hawking radiation uh, saturate that bound? The delta S generalized? Uh, no. Well, um, it depends how we it depends how we how we define things, um, and we're going to talk about this in great detail later, but. Um, the simple answer is, is no, because there's the thermal gas at the end of the day. Um, so you start with, you start with, um, yeah, so, so actually the entropy goes up. The, the, the generalized entropy goes up. So if the black hole at the center of the galaxy evaporated, it would have to change the entropy, like the baryons or whatever it evaporated to by like orders of magnitude? I guess so. Yes, that is crazy. It'll take a very long time for that to happen. The, the lifetime of a black hole is, of, of an astrophysical black hole is obscenely large. The Hawking temperature is very small. Other questions? So like the, the metric doesn't quite look like this. Yeah. In particular, Kerr has a dtd phi term, yeah. which is the rotation. Mm -hmm. um, the Hawking, I, I, I'm not sure whether the formula I wrote for the Hawking temperature is true for Kerr. I think it might be, actually. Yeah. Is it? OK, yeah. Um, because that was really a formula for the, for the uh, surface gravity, and it's the same formula. Um, Yeah, 
the area is still this. Yeah, a lot of the formulas are still true, like for, for rotating. Yeah. But it's also true we don't think that real astrophysical rotating black holes are like exactly curved. Um, In a similar way to this. Well, real. What do you mean by this? The, the real astrophysical black holes are very close to curve. Yeah. They're almost exactly curved at the event horizon and outside. There's somewhere deep inside an astrophysical black hole where there's like a collapsing star and there it's not it's not curve anymore. But. Other questions? So many, but they can. Yeah. Them. Okay. Yeah. The <laughs> truth is, I wasn't. Yeah. It was. A, that was the the preview. That was the preview of black hole thermodynamics. And now, uh, our task, the task ahead of us, is to is to really do black hole thermodynamics over the next couple months. So, uh, I think a good place to start is with Hawking radiation. So. We're now going to derive the Hawking effect. We're going to do this in two steps. Okay, this is is it a bit going to follow the format of our un discussion of unruh radiation. Let me remind you. First, we derived a, a math fact about the um, density matrix of a subregion of Minkowski space. And then we showed that there was actual physical consequence in terms of accelerating observers. Okay, so our goal is to do something similar now for the short shield black hole. I'm going to start by describing a mathematical fact, and then we're going to come back to the physics later. Um, and the reason uh, that I need to do it that way is that. I want to discuss the eternal short shield black hole because it's easier to talk about. So the eternal short shield, and we could do all this for Reese Nordstrom. I'm just going to do short shield to keep things simpler. Um, so the, the Penrose diagram of the short shield black hole looks like this. We live over here. And um, this is the event horizon. This is infinity up here. Um, and there's a second in, there's a second asymptotic region. This is the Einstein Rosen bridge. Uh, it takes us uh, to the second asymptotic region. Uh, so there's another copy of asymptotically flat space that's over here on the left. Um, I'm going to start with this eternal Schwarzschild black hole. This is not realistic. This is not what actual black holes look like. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but the reason this is a great place to start is because it's almost exactly like our discussion of uh, Rindler space. Okay, so let's take this diagram and divide it down the middle into regions A and B. And then our goal is to calculate rho A. And in fact, the calculation and discussion is really almost identical to our discussion of under radiation. Now, the first question you should ask is you want to calculate rho A in what state? In in uh, the Rindler calculation, we wanted to calculate in the in the Minkowski vacuum. Okay, so we need like the analog of the Minkowski vacuum. We need some state. Uh, we need to, to choose a state and then calculate rho a in that state. We'll define. Let's 
It's called the Hartle Hawking state. by doing the Euclidean path integral. Um, compare, for comparison, uh, this is the fact that the Minkowski vacuum was, remember that was the path integral on the lower half plane. Um, so now we want to define a, a, a state, which is the Euclidean path integral, but now on the black hole. We'll see that this state is thermal, and this calculation is much like the, the Rindler calculation. Uh, but for, there's this caveat that this is a definition, it's a choice of state, and we really need to come back later and, and revisit the question of what, what's the relevance of this state to like a black hole a real black hole. We'll come back to that. Um, but we're free to make this definition, and that's what we're going to do. Um, the first thing that I want to do is to calculate the temperature. Um, and we're going to do this by a quick trick. Um, and um, which is, comes from looking at the periodicity in imaginary time. But then we're going to come back and I'll discuss in more detail uh, the Euclidean path integral that justifies this. So to calculate the temperature, we just start from the metric. The Schwarzschild metric is minus 1 minus 2m over r dt squared plus dr squared over 1 minus 2m over r plus r squared the omega squared. What we're going to do is we're going to um, zoom in on the horizon and use our results of, of uh, Rindler space, where we showed that in order to have a smooth Euclidean manifold, um, there had to be an a imaginary time periodicity in order for this point to be this point at the center to be smooth. So to zoom in on the horizon. We define coordinates r and eta by the coordinate change r equals 2m times 1 plus big R squared over 16m squared. t is 4m eta. Then we expand for big R much less than m. With this change of variables, that's like expanding uh, the Schwarz, expanding near the Schwarzschild radius, r near near 2m. So this is a near horizon expansion. And if you just plug that into the metric and do the expansion, what you'll find is that the metric is minus r squared d eta squared plus d r squared plus 4m squared the omega square. Where did I get these funny changes of variables? Well, I knew I wanted to zoom in on the horizon. Um, so that's why I, I put a 2m, I rescaled here by 2m. And all the other factors, I just Fixed, I just fixed after the fact by, by 
declaring that I, I wanted this to look like Rindler space in the coordinates we used last time. So this here is Rindler. And um, now we know that in Rindler space, if we want this to have a smooth, if we want, if we want, so Rindler space, this is in Lorentzian signature. When we go to Euclidean signature, of course, these become polar coordinates. And if we want this to be smooth with no conical defect at the origin, we said that we have to identify in, in uh, eta. So we have to identify eta in imaginary time. So eta is equal to eta plus 2 pi i. That's the statement that the Euclidean manifold is smooth at uh, r equals 0. On the Penrose diagram, that point is here. It's the point in the very center, the bifurcation point in the Penrose diagram. So is it the horizon? Not just that point is on the horizon. No, no, the entire horizon, because r equal to 0 would be uh, r smaller equal to 2. If we, it depends, there's an order of limits issue because the coordinates are singular on the horizon. But if we fix eta to any number and then send r to zero, we land at the bifurcation point, the center point. If we want to land at somewhere else on the horizon, we would have to simultaneously scale eta to infinity as we sent r to zero. Because the, the coordinates look like this. Okay, so no matter what, if we sit here at fixed eta and we send r to zero, we're always going to land at this bifurcation point. Now let's take this imaginary time identification and um, rewrite it in terms of the, t, the Schwarzschild t coordinate. So uh, they just differ by a 4m. So what we're saying is that t has an imaginary time identification t plus 8 pi m pi. Well, identification of imaginary time means temperature. So from this, we read off the temperature to be 1 over 8 pi m. This is the Hawking temperature. Uh, and we're going to justify this more carefully with a path integral, but this quick trick is, is giving us the answer very quickly. It's just saying that if we do a path integral on the Euclidean manifold, that Euclidean manifold is going to be smooth. And so it's going to lead to a temperature 8 pi m, 1 over 8 pi m. Um, now, a very important difference from the UNRU radiation. UNRU radiation was sort of a fake, right? It was thermal with respect to the boost charge. And in order to see it, you had to talk about accelerating observers. Uh, Hawking radiation, on the other hand, is real. <laughs> uh, because in the sense, well, under radiation is real too. I don't want to diss it. Okay, but it's the ordinary energy. Okay, because T is the ordinary T coordinate. If we go far away from the black hole, this is the ordinary T coordinate of Minkowski space. And what we just found is that there's a, a temperature 1 over 8 pi m. And this is temperature coming from an identification of the t-coordinate and is therefore temperature with respect to the ordinary energy. Um, e being the charge conjugate to time translations. Unlike in Unruh radiation, where we found a temperature with respect to boost charge. This is really an ordinary temperature. It's an ordinary T coordinate that's identified.
So this is the temperature as measured by any Lorentz observer at infinity. Uh, that's correct, yes. Any inertial observer far away from the black hole will detect this temperature. Check the first law really quick, just because we, we can do it really easily. Um, so S is one fourth the area. The area of short shield we can just read off from the metric. We just set R to two M. Okay, so it's four pi uh, plus one fourth of um, four pi times R squared. Uh, which is 4 pi m squared. And um, now if we vary that, ds is 8 pi m dm. And it worked. So t ds is dm. Temperature 1 over 8 pi. Yeah, 8 pi. Okay, so this is just a quick check that this periodicity trick, which is telling us the temperature, is the same temperature that was appearing in the first law. By the way, as a historical, historical note, I should have mentioned that when the Hawking radiation came later, okay, so historically the, the first law, and I think the second law as well, came before Hawking temperature. Um, so that's why people thought it was really just an analogy, like the, the analogy to the laws of thermodynamics. They didn't think black holes were really thermal systems. And when they first wrote, the, uh, when they first wrote, wrote this, this down, um, they didn't know what coefficient to put here because you could multiply and divide by some number. Um, like you could, you could have guessed that maybe, maybe the entropy was like just area. And so there's this relative number that, that, that was unknown. Um, and um, it was just, it was later when Hawking did this independent calculation of the Hawking temperature uh, that these relative coefficients were fixed. And that's how we know the entropy comes with that factor of one fourth. It's in order to make this there was, a, there was a constant factor unfixed that was picked to make this work. Is this exactly what Hawking did this way? No. Um, I think if he had done it this way, nobody would have believed him, and they would have <laughs> like booed him off the stage, <laughs> which maybe is what people are tempted to do right now. OK. Um, no. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to come to that, but he really was talking about black holes that form by gravitational collapse. It makes the calculation. Uh, more difficult, but also more convincing. <laughs> and we're going to come to that. Other questions? Yeah, this can't be what Hawking did because I haven't I haven't made a physics I really haven't made a physics statement yet exactly. I defined a state and and showed you that there's thermal radiation in that state. But who who like who said that's the state? of a black hole. That's, that's another question, and that's, that we have to come to. Um, OK, so we're now going to get this. Um, we're now going to do a more, careful, a more careful Euclidean path integral derivation of this temperature. Uh, but I think we'll just do it next time. We're basically out of time. So if anyone has any questions, I can. Um, just answer questions and we'll stop here.